Thank you very much, Coach, and my family. Take your Bibles and go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. If you could with me, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry, it's my time to, to dismiss the kids. I don't have any pastor appreciation announcements, so kids can go. It's November, so we've we got to be done with that. Okay, there goes the kids. Very good. Okay, as Pastor mentioned uh, this week, our endeavor has been to really reawaken our understanding of who Jesus is. And we took some time on Sunday morning to look at Psalm 16, and looking at the fact that Jesus is enough. And I don't know if you went through that message like I have before, or heard messages like that, where I've heard about Jesus being enough, and I thought, boy, that preaches well, and that sounds good, but what does that actually mean? And so my goal, as the Lord was leading, is to, through the evening sessions, as we looked at the fact that Jesus is a pursuing God, that Jesus is a forgiving God, and that Jesus is a loving God, that when we understand in a more full and deep way what kind of a person Jesus is, it attracts us and draws us to want to know Him, uh, but to want to continue to walk with Him, because He is a very real, intimate person. As real as you and I are here tonight, sitting here in flesh and bones with, body, or with blood coursing through our bodies, today Jesus Christ is also in the exact same fashion, seated at the right hand of God, but He still today bears the exact same body as you and I do. Of course, it is glorified, but I want us to understand He still is a man. He still bears that body, which means he can identify with everything that you and I identify with. He can understand. He's felt it. And I do believe that uh, if you were to go through Scripture, every time there is a scriptural command for us as believers or a charge for us as believers to do something, whatever it may be, whether it be praying or, or uh, uh, confessing or, or forgiving or uh, uh, loving, you will always see Jesus illustrating, demonstrating that same thing in the scriptures. Because he never calls us to do anything that he himself has not borne or done for us as well. And so tonight as we conclude this, this, these services, I was asking the Lord that he would give clarity. And uh, now for about two days, I've sensed this is where the Lord was going to lead us here uh, for our final service. Tonight I want to look at uh, just a couple of verses, in fact three verses here in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And there's really just one phrase in verse 3, three that we're going to center in on because there's a phrase here that I want us to see. Uh, and it is the phrase, the simplicity of that is in Christ, because this message this whole week has been trying to draw our attention back to the person. Not necessarily the doctrine, though that is included, but I want us to see the person. Too often we've gotten consumed with doctrine and theology and missed the person, and I want us to see the person. So look with me in verse 1 as, as the Apostle Paul is writing here, and he's, he's worked up, he is uh, uh, passionate as he writes this. So look with me in verse 1, he says this, Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. In context, what Paul is trying to do here, if, if you understand the reasons for the writing of the second uh, epistle to the Corinthians, Paul is incredibly invested in the Corinthian church. When they were struggling, well, he would have been instrumental in their planting and leading many of them to Christ. And so uh, he, he's, he's so passionate that they continue walking with Jesus Christ. And, and as he leaves Corinth, he has learned that there's trouble in Corinth. There's a, a, a man who is having relationships with his stepmom. And so he writes his first epistle epistle to the Corinthians challenging them like saying look guys you've got a lot of problems in your church and they take the correction after the first epistle and they take the correction really well and it warms his heart but he's having to write this second epistle because he has learned that there are detractors in the Corinthian church who have come and they've basically said all right Corinthian church the apostle Paul is gone and and we think that the apostle Paul he's not that great of a preacher uh, he's a really small guy with not a lot of credentials well actually he did have credentials but they're trying to demean the apostle 
apostle. And basically their argument is uh, Paul's not preaching the correct gospel. And we don't think Paul, uh, he, he thinks too much of himself. He's a little bit arrogant. He, he thinks he's all that in a bag of chips. And so uh, basically uh, that we have a more, a, a better uh, theology. And so these false teachers are beginning to teach them and they're really demeaning and detracting Paul. Paul gets word of this and he's grieved, not necessarily uh, because his reputation has been slandered, though that certainly he's going to address that, but what his passionate uh, uh, jealousy that he talks about in verse 2 is he's burdened by the fact that these Corinthian believers who he so dearly loves, who he has given himself to their, to their hearing of the word, he is learning that they're missing Jesus. They're learning doctrine, but it's not the doctrine of Jesus. And these false teachers are mixing Judaism with Christianity. And basically what they're saying is, hey, let's appreciate Jesus Christ, but you've got to make sure you're doing the law as well, which is incredibly complicated, very complex, and very wrong. And so the apostle is very burdened that they understand theology, but his greatest burden is that they understand the fact that when it comes to Jesus Christ, it's really very simple. And so my burden for us tonight is we've looked at several services trying to get an understanding of who is Jesus. And maybe our attention has been reawakened to that's the person Jesus. And I, and I trust through those services you were helped by that. To see he's a pursuing God, a forgiving God, a loving God. And so now as we conclude, here's my burden. And when I mean conclude, I mean of the week, not the message. I have a little more to go. Uh, as we conclude this week, my burden is so don't lose Jesus. Don't lose track of him. Don't lose who he is. So he starts in verse 1 says, Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly and indeed bear with me. So what he's saying here, if you're anything like me, I read that and I think, well, I don't really understand what that means to bear with me in my folly. It would be like, uh, if we were to put this in our context, it would be like if in this church there was rumors being spread and there, let's just say there's some men in the church saying, you know, hey, we, we don't really appreciate pastor royalty. Um, you, you, you notice what kind of vehicle pastor royalty drives? Yeah, I, I notice what kind of van he drives. Yeah, he's in it for the money. <laughs> pastor royalty is at this church completely self-serving. He's in it for the money. Do you know the paycheck he gets? Oh, man. And, and imagine if in this church that, that rumor started being spread. And so people started hearing about it and they say, wait, wait, do you think he's that self-serving? Oh, we really, we really do. And if the rumor started being spread, there's some of you that would get up in arms saying, hey, hey, that's not true. Have you seen the rust on that van? He's not doing it for the money, man. He's doing it because he loves the people. And if this rumor were to continue, it might be appropriate for a pastor to stand up on a Sunday morning and say, okay, church family, I just need to nip this in the bud. I understand that this is silly that I even have to say this, but I just want you to know I am not here for the money. Bear with me in my silliness, but I want you all to know I'm here because I love you. So if pastor did that in this context, that's the exact same thing what the Apostle Paul is doing here. He's saying this is foolish that I even have to uh, defend my apostleship. Look, guys, is there anybody who's been stoned and shipwrecked for your cause? Is there anybody who's been beaten uh, one stripe away from death? Is there anybody who is left to, uh, on, the, on, the, on the, the uh, street there to die for the purpose of giving you the gospel? No, there isn't. That's been me. This is foolish that I have to even defend myself, but I'm going to because it's necessary. And he tells us the passion for why he's so burdened. Verse 2, he says this, For I am jealous. That word jealous, not in, usually we think of that in a negative context as maybe a, person, a gal who's jealous over a guy and, and there's that, that tension, there's that carnality, but that's not what's here. It's the idea of the word zeal, passion. He's saying, I'm passionate over you. Uh, not for my own gain. It's not for about me. It's godly passion. For I'm jealous with you uh, for a, with a godly pa a jealousy. For, this is the reason, I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So what he's doing here is he's hearkening back to the marriage system that all these people were accustomed to. And he's trying to help them realize I am invested in you, not for my gain, but for yours. Now, in the American context, we don't often... Um, when, when, when we look at Palestinian uh, first century marriages, it's very different than the way we do it then, or do, do it now, excuse me. If you were going to get married, uh, maybe as the guy, you would, you'd, you'd propose to the young lady, and then you'd start picking your, your groomsmen, and there would be one guy that you would pick that's usually maybe your brother or a best friend, and you would call that the best man. And the best man's responsibility in America is pretty minimal. 
Uh, I've been a best man a couple of times and I still don't know what they do. I have been told that you have to make, usually you hold the ring and you have to make sure that they get something to eat and so on and so forth, but that's about, that's about all you do. At least that's what all I was told. Maybe there's more to the etiquette, I don't know, that's just what I was told. But in, a, in the first century context, that's not how a best man was treated. The friend of the bride is, is the, is the, the, uh, the title here. When a, when a man would go and espouse himself to a wife, so they've not consummated the marriage, it's not the, it's not the, uh, the marriage ceremony, but legally they're married. What that man, the, the groom-to-be, he's asked the girl she'd marry him. They're all agreed on the matter. They're now espoused, legally they're married, not ceremonially. He would go to this man who he trusts, who really the couple trusts, who they consider a very good friend. And as the groom is about to go off and prepare a house, he'd come to that friend and say, okay, friend, you see the gal that I just espoused? Okay, she's, she's your guard now. She's your watch. You take care of her. And if I understand this correctly, as I've been trying to read up on this, read several, several articles trying to wrap my mind around this, if I understand correctly, this best man was now responsible for the well-being and the chastity of this young lady. And if I understand correctly, to, according to the Hebrew scholars that I have read, on the day of the wedding, when the ceremony is commencing and, and they have the ceremony, and they pronounce it all man and wife, and they're going to consummate the marriage on the very same day, the best man's responsibility would have had been gone to that special marriage room, have guarded the doors, brought the young lady in, and then closed the doors while he's waiting for the groom. Because it is his responsible until the point that they consummate that marriage, it is his responsibility to guard her virginity. And at the point that the groom finally comes from greeting his guest, he would step aside, let the groom go into the bedchamber, and then at that point, he has been freed from his responsibility. And if at any point in the marriage or in the pursuing of this young lady that there had been any wonderings, hey, we're not sure if she is a virgin any longer, like it was with Mary, the, the best man would have been consulted. They would have said, hey, what do you know about this situation? And he would have to either affirm or deny her chastity. So this person that, that is described here, the, the friend of the groom, Paul is saying, I, I feel like I've taken on that role for you. You, as the bride of Jesus Christ, I am longing with everything in me, not for my sake, but for yours, not for my good, for, but for yours. I am longing with great passion that you, Corinthian church, you, Broadview, Broadview Heights, Broad, yes, I said that right, that's a big word, Broadview Heights Baptist Church, he's saying, I have passion that this church would stand before Jesus someday as a chaste virgin. Can you, can you sense the passion in him? It's not for his own good. It's for somebody else's. Have you ever heard a story of uh, someone having an accident and they, someone tells you the story of the accident? You know, maybe let's say it's a logging story. This, at least this has happened in Maine. I've been, I heard a story about a, a guy that I uh, knew who was in a logging accident and he's, he's cutting, bringing his chainsaw through the backside, finishing off his back cut, and it kicks back and slices him in the leg, nearly takes his leg off. He's laying there in the snow, bleeding out. Like When you hear a story like that, if you're anything like me, I immediately start feeling the pain. And I'm like, oh boy, that just sounds so painful. Though I am not feeling physical pain, I feel his pain. Are you tracking with me? The illustration I gave last night about Emma going through birth. I did not feel birthing pangs in my stomach. But let me tell you, I was feeling for her. Emotionally, I was hurting for her, though physically I wasn't hurting. This is the picture that Paul is trying to communicate. He's saying, guys, it's not about me. I hurt for you because I long that you would be simple and just follow Christ. See, unfortunately in our world today, flesh creeps its way into Christianity and we are really good at complicating things. What we do is we come into a church like this, we say, hey, everybody's wearing a suit and tie, or at least most people, if I'm going to look like a good Christian, I have to dress a certain way. We, we look at a church like this and we say, hey, they go soul winning on Saturdays. Oh boy, if the pastor's going to like me, I have to go soul winning. You know, the pastor would love for you to go soul winning, but he would hate for you to go soul winning, soul winning for his sake. We look at a, a movement like this and we say, oh no, I must have holiness. I must have purity. And we give ourselves, set up this standard and this rule and this rule, and we're doing it all for the wrong reason. It's an incredibly complicated 
And what the Apostle Paul is getting across is, he says, look, drop the complication. It's all about one person, and his name is Jesus Christ. It's simple. The simplicity of Christianity is Jesus Christ. And so he says in verse 3, this, this is what complicates matters. Look at verse 3. He says, I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And so he makes it very clear the issue of the Christian life is not the rules and the standards and the attire. The issue of the Christian life is how you think and it's your, how you think about Jesus Christ. And he's saying, just like the serpent beguiled Eve and she was lied to and she believed the lie and, and was corrupted from following Christ, so we, every single time we lose focus on Jesus Christ, it is because intrinsically we've believed a lie. Now, there are a lot of really good Christian books that try to help us uh, work through and, and grow in our Christian life, but no Christian book is of any value uh, unless it points a man to Jesus Christ. Because the person Jesus is everything. So as he concludes verse 3, his whole passion is, don't lose Jesus. Now, when I make a statement like that, what goes through your mind? I was at a conference a couple years ago, and the pastor was preaching, and, and uh, his, the, the title of his message uh, was, Get Them to Jesus. And, it, and, and he kept repeat, repeating that phrase, you know, if you've got needy people, get them to Jesus. You've got hurting people, get them to Jesus. You've got people who are addicted, get them to Jesus. And he went on and on. There's a lot of amens. It was kind of like one of those red meat messages. You just, yeah, that's good. And, and, it, and it was good, but I remember sitting there thinking, like, what does that mean? Like, get them to Jesus. Like, I can put it on a track and I can put it on a t-shirt, but what does it actually mean? The point that he was driving to and the point that Paul is driving to is, let's not get complicated. Jesus is a person, as real as you and I, with a personality and a voice, uh, a sense of humor, everything. And if you would just take some time to get to know him, he would take care of all the complication. He'll make it really simple. Imagine with me that, uh, let's say you and your family, you're going to go on a family vacation and, and you and your wife, you're looking at it. And let's just say that your wife is super into like, you know, planning out the intricacies of this, of this uh, uh, vacation. And you're out west maybe and you're going to go to this national park and you get to this big, huge national park and you get there and there's people just buzzing all over the place. And it's just a, just a bunch of uh, movement and busyness. And maybe you're thinking, oh boy, I don't know if this was a good idea. And, and uh, let's just say a, a, a tour guide comes up and gives you a map. Here's a map of the National Park and you look at the map and it's like a just intense spider web of trails and things to see and, and nothing is marked well and there's no signs. You don't know where the restrooms are or the main room and you're just thinking, I, this is just, I don't think we can do this. Like, I don't, if you're anything like me, I like really clear signs and one path. So it's very obvious that's the way to go. But there have been some places that, I don't know if you've been in those situations where you walk into it, whether it be a store or a museum, you're like, I'm just overwhelmed by the craziness of this place. And so imagine with me, you're looking at that map, you're like, I have no idea what to do, where to start. To, I want to see this, but I, can, I mean, this would take me five days. To, it's kind of like going to the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. You just can't do it all. You feel overwhelmed. And so imagine with me, that tour guide walks up and says, I know this place like the back of my hand. You say, you do? He says, yeah, just if you follow me, I'll show you the best way. Okay, okay, I'll hold on to this map. He says, no, 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 let's make it simple. Ditch the map and just follow me. See, that's what Jesus has done to us. See, we can get really confused. Like, okay, I, I've got to grow in this area and this area and this area, and I'm messing up over here, and I need to work on this, and I need to get purity there, and I need to, I need to oh, where do I start? In fact, just a couple nights ago, there was a man in this auditorium that told me, he says, I know I've got so much growth to do, but I don't even know where to start. And I challenged him. I said, brother, you don't need to figure that out. You just need to find your tour guide because he takes the complication out of it. And when you go and find Jesus Christ, okay, okay, find Jesus Christ, what does that mean? Let me see if I can try to explain it as best as I understand. If we would just stop and take some time, and I'm not trying to be, um, what's the word I'm looking for, irreligious, but sometimes what I have to do in my prayer time is I have to imagine that Jesus is sitting right there. Like, if I put my hand right there, I'd feel his shoulder. Now, I can't actually see him, but oftentimes I will imagine that because it's so difficult. Because we cannot see Jesus, it's hard to remember that he's a person. 
Okay, let me, I want to try to, if I can, just illustrate this very quickly. Pastor, do you mind coming up here and sitting right here? And I'm going to ask Kay, or excuse me, um, Cuz and Nathan to come up here. Okay. Is pastor a person? Cuz, why don't you guys, you guys come over here. Is pastor a person? Do you guys tell me yes or no? Yes. Is he a good person? Yes. Good. Okay. I heard some no's, I think. <laughs> Does pastor have a personality? Is there anyone in the world like him? Does he have brothers? Do they look like him? They have similarities, right? There's royalty, family traits, but none of them are like Brother Joel, correct? Okay, if you search the entire world, Miss Dina, would you ever find a man who was just like your husband? No, praise the Lord, she says. Okay, does he have a sense of humor? Does he have a tone of voice? Is it different than any other preacher who's ever been here? Okay, we all agree on that. Now, Let's take this, this pastor who we've agreed, he's a person, he's got a personality, we all know him, he's very clear to us because we can see him. Now, fellas, I want you guys to stand over here and I want you to put, hold this sheet right in front. So Nathan, yep, take that, hold that sheet in front of, in front of your dad. So go right in front of him, hold it, hold it up there. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Is pastor behind the sheet? Is pastor real? Does he have a personality? But I can't see him. Does he have a personality? Does he have a sense of humor? See, the problem is, because we can't see Jesus, we get freaked out and think, oh no, he's lost his personality. We've lost his, per- he's lost his sense of humor. He's lost his personhood. And the truth is, you know, if I lifted up this sheet just a little bit, and we could see, okay, yes, that's good. He shined him once. We saw, we could see uh, evidence that there's someone back there. But if we went weeks and weeks and weeks, and every time you came in here, there's a sheet there, you would actually, if you never saw any movement back there, you would actually start to doubt the validity that there's a Pastor Joel royalty behind that sheet because you can't see him. And the way to solve this problem, if you can't see him, would be to come up to the sheet and say, Brother Joel? Yes, sir. (laughs) Okay, I think that was him. It sounded like him. Uh, Brother Joel, are you good at dad jokes? Uh, I try. That sounds like him. I mean, that's, that's exactly right, like him. Uh, you know, you can, you, you can start asking those questions and hearing in his voice. You say, okay, though I cannot see him, that's the telltale marks. I know that's Joel royalty. Are you tracking with me? Jesus Christ is, is just, okay, I'm going to drop this, fellas, is just as real as Joel royalty sitting there. But for some reason, because we can't see him, we find ourselves and we get very comfortable with believing he's a force or an emanation and missing the fact that he's a person. If Jesus is simply a force or an emanation, our conclusion then is, how much of his power can I get a hold of? But if he's a person, my desire is, how much can he get a hold of me? See, as we begin to spend time, the veil is drawn. We can't see Jesus Christ, but if you were to go and to hear his voice and ask him some questions and you would begin to discover, though I cannot see him, I know him. Someday, faith is going to be made sight. And as the songwriters have written, when I see him... Someday when I see his face, I think Fanny Crosby was the one that said, being blind, I'm so excited. The first man I will ever see with my eyes is the face of Jesus Christ. And when we get to finally see Jesus, we will say, wow, it was worth it all when we see Jesus. But for now, since we can't see him, we must hear him. We must spend time talking to him. And as, fellas, you can sit down. Pastor, stay here. And as real as I would sit here next to Pastor and put my hand on his shoulder and have a conversation with him and tell him some jokes and he would laugh and try to tell some jokes to me and I may or may not laugh, as real as he and my relationship is, Pastor, could you stand up and go back to your seat? If Jesus is right there, though I cannot see him, it's just as real. 
There have been many times when I have gone to my prayer closet and I have felt that there's so much that needs to be confessed and I feel so guilty that as I have bowed down here feeling the complication of my confession and trying to get it right and all this kind of stuff, I have imagined Jesus Christ just putting his arm around me, just squeezing me close. Because if I could see him in physical form, that's exactly what he would be doing. Because he's that real. Church family, every need that I have, every weakness that I have, the solution is the person Jesus. I mentioned at the beginning of the week, the, the, the spirit is the physician, but the medicine is Jesus Christ. And so we as a church, though we've, our, our thinking has been changed. He's a pursuing God. He wants me. He's a forgiving God. That's his knee-jerk reaction. Oh, he's a loving God, which compels me to love him back. Our burden for tonight is don't lose sight of Jesus. Don't lose the person. It may, at first I felt silly, and I didn't tell anybody that I was doing this because I didn't know if that was ever acceptable in Christendom to actually imagine that he was there. But boy, it's helped me. There was at one point, and uh, we were driving from, oh boy, I can't remember where we were driving. It was on, we were on the East Coast, it was earlier this spring, and I think, I think we were going from either from Pennsylvania or Maryland. We were driving up the East Coast, and back in the spring, April time, maybe it was March, uh, fuel prices are going through the roof, kind of like they are right now. And we've got a 40-gallon tank on that truck, and so you fill it up, it's like $250. And I'm looking at our bank account, and we're, we're driving up there, and, and I'm going through those eastern board states, and the, the, it's just expensive for fuel. And I found myself getting anxious and worried and fretful. And, 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 and in that position, I, I began, the Lord began to minister to me, Caleb, use my credit card today. And I, and I imagined myself, because my wife was in the back seat, I imagined myself reaching, and I literally reached across to the passenger seat, imagining that my co-pilot is Jesus, because he is. That's not just a country song. He really is. And I can actually say, Jesus, take the wheel, and it means a whole lot more than just a country song. That's actually a great line. Jesus, I need you to do this. And I literally reached across, and it helped my soul to take his credit card. I used mine. But in that action, I was taking ownership of the fact that he's a person, and I'm going to trust you with this. I, what I'm trying to do at church family is trying to put concrete images to what we often hear in theory. Because here in the church, we're so good at hoping everybody else has Jesus, and we miss him ourselves. And you don't need to turn there, but I want to draw your attention back to Luke chapter 2. You don't have to turn there if you don't want to. You, you certainly can if you would like to. But in Luke chapter 2, verses 41 and through 52, we see the only account in Scripture of Jesus as a young man. Several of the Gospels give us Jesus' uh, birth account. Luke 2 would do that. But this is the only glimpse in the Scriptures where we see Jesus as a young man. 12 years old. He and his parents have gone to the Passover. You guys remember this story? They've gone to the Passover. They've been there in Jerusalem. They've been at the temple. And, and uh, after the ceremonies and the, the procedures are all done, they're, they're leaving uh, Jerusalem. And the scripture tells us that as they're leaving Jerusalem, they go a day's journey. A whole day of traveling. I don't know how exactly how many miles that was, but they're going with their caravan. They've gone eight hours, ten hours, twelve hours, whatever it is. And it's an entire day of travel. And they finally, in the evening, get to their resting place. And whether they were traveling together, we don't know. But there's a conversation between Mary and Joseph. And Joseph walks up and says, hey, hey, Mary, uh, where's Jesus? And she says, I thought you had him. I, I don't have Jesus. You're the mother. I thought you're supposed to have the children. And, and she says, you don't have Jesus? He says, I don't have Jesus. Well, he's probably with Uncle So-and-so. Well, we better go check, because we need to get bed down for the night. And so they go to Uncle So-and-so, and, and they say, hey, do you have Jesus? Oh, he hasn't been with us. We've not seen him all day. Maybe he's over with friend So-and-so. And so they run over there to the other side of camp, and do, do you guys have Jesus? In fact, the text tells us they go throughout the whole caravan asking, does anybody have Jesus? And they're all saying, no, we, we don't have Jesus. You, you don't have Jesus? No, we don't have Jesus. And they, they're beginning to, uh, they, they get back together, Mary and Joseph, and they realize, we've searched the camp, and we don't have Jesus. Well, where's Jesus? And they say, well, he, he must be back in the temple. 
And so in that position, because they're not willing to go on, they leave the caravan and they go back to the, the, the temple because they're looking. They've got to find Jesus. Now, is it just because they, they got to find him because, you know, they, that's the only kid they had and they couldn't, you know, they just couldn't afford adoption. And so they thought, man, we got to stick with the one we got. Is that the reason why they want the boy? No, I think Jesus changed their home quite a bit. I think Jesus affected the way they lived quite a bit. The scripture doesn't tell us much about Jesus' early life, but I can promise you if he's the son of God, he made a difference in that home. If we as human parents uh, gain joy when our child does something kind, says a word of encouragement. Uh, not long ago, Gilbert, I was working on something and, and it was out by the trailer and Gilbert walks up to me and Gilbert goes, good job, daddy. <laughs> That actually warmed my heart, but then, you know, you're three years old, but whatever, that, 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 was, that was nice. Okay, if we as human parents enjoy when our children do something nice, imagine what it was like when you have a three-year-old Jesus running around. How that must have warmed their heart. Imagine being the brother and sister of Jesus. Now, you'll hear comedians, there's one in particular that makes his whole routine about the fact of what it would be like to be the brother of Jesus, and he makes his whole routine like, man, that would stink. Imagine growing up with a kid who was perfect. But I don't think Jesus was pushing his perfection. I don't think he walked to his brothers and say, see this? Never been spanked. I don't think he flaunted that. If unsaved people, if wine bibbers and drunkards fell in love with him, I'm pretty sure his brothers and sisters loved being around him. So when they lost him, they knew it. They felt it and they said, we don't want to go on. And so what did they do? They went back where they had last left him. And they searched for three days. He's been gone four days now. And they're searching and finally they find him. And they come to him saying, why have you put us through this? We're missing you. And in essence, he says, I'm doing the Lord's work. And if you hadn't left me, you wouldn't have lost me. Church family, too often, that's exactly where we're at in our church today. We come to the revival meeting or a church service on a regular basis and we say, well, I hope my wife has Jesus. I hope my husband has the spirit of Jesus. You know, our troubles in our house would be fixed if my husband would just have the spirit of Jesus. You know, things would go a lot better in church if our deacons would just have Jesus. And I, I really hope my pastor has Jesus because we need to be fed. And then when we realize that uh, Jesus is missing, we go around to our friends and family and say, well, well, don't you have Jesus? Well, don't you have the presence of Jesus, the very victorious, grace-filled life flowing through you? And they say, no, we don't know where Jesus is. And the only conclusion that we as believers must come to is I must leave all until I find Jesus again. And just like the parents of Jesus forsook the caravan, the safety and they went and searched earnestly for four days until they finally found him. So must we, church family, take the time that is necessary to get reacquainted with Jesus again. May I ask you, does the very nature and spirit of Jesus, who Jesus is, does it mark your home? He was known to be a man who was gentle and lowly. He was known to be a leader of great strength, but never overbearing. He was known to be a servant. He was known to be a man who stood up when the time was right and share a direct, strong word when was needed, and he was known to stand there and allow himself to be buffeted when was necessary. Does the person Jesus mark your home? Or have you also lost Jesus? Oswald Chambers, I mentioned him earlier this week. At one point, he was preaching at a large conference. He worked with what was called in that day the holiness movement, and not to be confused with Pentecostals, it was a movement of people who desperately wanted holiness. And he was uh, writing home to his spouse, and he said this, quote, I see churches and schemes and missionary enterprises and holiness movements all tagged with his name but oh, how little of himself. What he was saying is we can print it on the side of the building and we can put a banner outside and we can pass out a tract and we can put a road sign or a lawn sign in our front yard that claims his name. We can put it on our walls. We can put it on our doormats and his name is present, but his person is missing. 
Brothers and sisters, does the purity of Jesus mark your life? Does the unconditional love of Jesus mark your life? Does the forgiveness of Jesus mark your marriage? Does the grace and lowliness mark your business? Today I was, uh, I, I put these shoes on. These shoes are, I don't know, they're leather shoes that I've taken some time to polish. As I put them on this morning, it reminded me of a friend of mine who uh, he and I had gone through a, a program together, some search and rescue training, and, and when he got out of this program, man, he did everything. He was telling me just recently, he said, man, I kept my shoes polished. He said, I went to the community college there in my hometown, and I kept my shoes polished. He said, one of my teachers was, was an ex-military member, and, and uh, I'm sitting there, man, my, my shoes for class are just polished. And he says, he walked up to me as we're getting ready to walk into the classroom. This is the teacher there at his community college. Says, hey, Dan, nice polish. He says, yes, sir, thank you. And then the man went, scuff, and walked past him. And I'm thinking, what did you do, bro? Man, I would. And he said, oh, I just laughed. And I'm thinking to myself, there's no way I would laugh. Man, I'd get in that guy's face and say, do you know how many hours I spent on this? And, and that was where, as I would put these shoes on, I looked at my polish, I started remembering that, that thought. And, I, and immediately the vehement just energy began to build up in myself. And because I've been preparing for this message, the Holy Spirit said, mm, and would that be a response of Jesus? Well, it would be a legitimate response, yes, but it wouldn't be Christ-like. Has anybody else here, you don't have to raise your hand, anybody else here ever watched videos on, on YouTube of like road rage people and you find yourself thinking, man, if that guy got out of my vehicle, I'd get ready to just, and I have to ask myself, so would that be the mind of Christ? See, it's so easy in our American culture, especially if we've grown up on watching John Wayne movies, to get the idea that that's what a real man looks like. But a real man is Jesus. So does Jesus mark your life? He, Oswald Chambers said, I've, I've seen it talked about, but oh, how little of himself. He was speaking at a conference later on. It would be a holiness conference, and this is what he said, quote, he, oh, this would have been the turn of the century where socialism is, is becoming a, uh, a, a big deal and which would catapult them into World War I. But he, he, he's standing before the conference, and this is what he said, quote, The snare of an audience like this is not the snare of a shallow socialism. It is the snare of a selfish holiness with no God in it. Holiness is an individual protest that God may lift the life of the church to the standard he made for it, not an individual pet based on my little convictions. What does holiness magnify, he said, Jesus ever, Jesus only, Jesus all in all. A.W. Tozer said, we become so engrossed in the work of the Lord that we've forgotten the Lord of the work. Isn't it so easy to find ourselves missing Jesus Christ? May I ask you, brothers and sisters, do you come to church services to try to keep people pleased? Do you have a relationship with your spouse that is amiable but not great? Do you treat your children with anger? Do you regularly fly off the handle and excuse it as just my personality? Because these are indications that We've lost Jesus. Do you only pray when you go to bed or maybe when you have a meal? It indicates we've lost the presence of Jesus. Do you go a long time without confessing or making sure you feel bad enough before you confess, then you've missed the person of Jesus. Ephesians 4 says, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. Verse 20 says, But ye have not so learned Christ. The Apostle Paul is saying, look, the unbelievers, they don't know who Jesus is, so all they know to do is live in anxiety and complication. But you know Jesus, so don't live there. Know the simplicity of Jesus Christ. And let me conclude by saying this. Every single one of us who, if you've been hurt or believed a lie about yourself, you're living a complicated life because you're trying to overcome the lies. And if you're overcoming the lies without Jesus, it, it's a complicated life. But keep in mind that if you've ever been abused, whether it be sexually or physically, and you feel like you're damaged goods, you feel like you're not worth as much, the truth is 
He says you're precious. He says you are fearfully and wonderfully made. He says you are unconditionally loved and forgiven. He is the one. Jesus is the only one, not the psychiatrist, not the self-help book, not the pastors. It's Jesus who can make beauty from ashes. He can restore the years the locusts have eaten. His whole entire ministry was given to the purpose of redemption. You are not too far gone if you would just go back to Jesus. Do you feel rejected? Jesus was. He was called the stone that was rejected and it is now the chief cornerstone. He knows what it's like to be abandoned and so he knows how to identify with you and he knows how to restore. Do you feel anxious? Well, Jesus, the person Jesus, he was never anxious. Peace was his nature. In fact, Jesus never in his lifetime was ever ruffled. You say, well, that's because he's Jesus. Yes, that's the point. So what if we would enter into knowing the person Jesus we could live the same way. Peter said it well when he looked to Jesus Christ after Jesus asked them, where will you go? Will you go also? And he says, how could we leave? For thou hast the words of life. Church family, in simplicity, my, my challenge for us tonight is to not raise up a list of standards it is not to raise up a list of rules. It is not to tell you, okay, now these are all the things that good Christians do. That's not my goal tonight. My goal is to say, church family, we need to get to know Jesus. The daily life is a constant looking to him, a constant trusting him with abandon. And I think I've said this three times, but I say it now. I just turned off my iPad. I will conclude with this. Recently, a friend of mine challenged me with this thought. He's reading a book, and the author in the book describes a paradigm that too often we find ourselves in. The paradigm is you as a believer in your Christian life, you're trying to do right, and you come to a crossroads in your Christian life. There you look up at the crossroads, and the two signs indicate the two different paths. You, you can't take both. It's one or the other. And the two paths are one is pleasing God, and the other crossroad is trusting, believing, looking to God. And in our minds, we would say, that's not a crossroad. Shouldn't that be one path? How could you say that there's a, a crossroad between the two? It's, it's, if I trust God, I please Him. If I please Him, I trust Him. They're, 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 they can't be two different paths. What the author points out is too often we find ourselves in our Christian lives living a complicated life of trying to do all kinds of things to please God when that's not what God is looking for. What He is looking for us to do is to simply trust Him. What that means is it is a constant, everyday decision. The moment I rise, I, I swing my, my legs over to the floor and I sit there and I say, Lord, I'm tired. Lord, I need your strength. It's not trying to be Christ-like. It's not trying to say, Lord, I'm trying to do the things that please you. That's not the life of Christianity. The Christianity is a constant fellowship, a constant abiding, where I'm just looking to him, talking to him about everything in my life. When I walk down the steps to go take care of my children uh, and I start to hear them scream and cry and I'm irritated by the fact that they're early up and, I, and at that point I say, now Lord, I need your grace right now. Give me your love. And you help put them down and you go back and the, there's a temptation, go back to bed or stay up and, and to take your time with the Lord and you don't want to do that because your flesh hates that. And it's at that point you say, now Lord, I need your strength. Lord, I don't want to uh, spend this time because I'm tired. It's a constant, regular communication. And you walk out of your house on your way to the job, and immediately the pressures of the day are starting to mount. You already know what's waiting for you on your desk, and you don't feel like you have enough time or enough energy or enough resources. And it's at that point you say, Lord, today's on you. I can't get that paperwork unless you help me. Lord, I don't know how to take care of my job. Lord, I'm not perceptive enough. Lord, I'm not smart enough. Lord, I'm just looking to you. It's not a day of constantly trying to be anxious. It is a day of just constantly laying it back up to him all day long with every single decision. You say, that's a lot of talking to Jesus. Yep, that's the point. We can't see him, but we can talk to him. And as we spend time with him, we'll be reassured in the person of Jesus Christ. Paul says, I fear that you would lose the simplicity. So my, church, my, my challenge, church, is don't miss, don't lose Jesus Christ. Can I ask you all to bow with me and close your eyes? Any great man of God in the past, if you were to read his biography, you will find every great man of God came to a place of simplicity. They weren't great because they had great personalities or great giftings. They were great because they learned simple, 
looking all day long to Jesus. And that pleases God. With heads bowed and eyes closed, it may be that some of us tonight are recognizing that the very life of Jesus, the grace, the mercy, the compassion, the lack of irritation, that Jesus does not mark our home. It doesn't mark our business. Anger, aggression, frustration, irritation, selfishness, self-motivation, anxiety, complication, frustration. That's what marks our lives? Well, then we've missed Jesus. It's not a matter of trying to figure out a way to go back to him or fix your problems as much as it is just go back to the guide and lay even the fact that I don't even know how to fix my problems at his feet and trust him for it. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if God has dealt with you about a specific area or simply you would just say, now, Lord, I need you to give me a reawakening of your voice so I know your person. If tonight God has dealt with you, I would encourage you, would you take the time to lay it at his feet? Not trying to impress him, but just laying your every need, even your inability to communicate your needs, lay it before him.